Good morning, everyone. Welcome to all those who were lost and are now found. Hallelujah, hey? I'm just going to read a, a verse from a couple of different um, translations because sometimes I think we get very, very familiar with verses we know really well. So this one is um, from the Mirror Translation. And it says, the entire cosmos is the object of God's affection. And he is not about to abandon his creation. The gift of his son is for mankind to realize their origin in him who mirrors their authentic birth. Begotten not of flesh, but of the father. In this persuasion, the life of the ages echoes within the individual and announces that the days of regret and sense of lostness are over. God has no intention to condemn anyone. He sent his son not to be the judge, but to be the savior of the world. It's a different sounding verse, isn't it? You may know it more as, for God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that so, so that whoever believes and trusts in him as saviour shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge and condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And we are, we're an expression of the body of Christ in this place. And we are saved, we're redeemed, so let's stand and say so.
you have done so much more than what is contained in the words of this song and that is that you have actually made each one of us your dwelling place. We honour you, we worship you in this day. Father, help us to love each other as you have loved us. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I welcome everyone and any visitors to the church and our online viewers. I have no birthdays this week that I know of, so if you are having a birthday, happy birthday. Oh, okay, Kristen, yes. Denise and Graham's daughter, Kristen, it's her birthday tomorrow, so we wish Kristen happy birthday. Um, wedding anniversaries this week. Congratulations, Tim and Brittany. Um, on the 15th on Wednesday is your wedding anniversary, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Nine years married. Congratulations. Um, this coming week, we have um, Monday, we have a mission meeting at 1 p.m. We have Boys Brigade at 6 15 p.m. On Tuesday, we have um, Connect Group at 9 30 a.m. We have an elders meeting at 5.30 p.m. On Wednesday, we have KYB at 9.30 a.m. Thursday, we have an ASD support group at 9.30 a.m. And of course, next Sunday, a morning worship at 9 a.m. The Mission Support Committee is having its first meeting for 2023 on Monday at 1 p.m. in the church hall. All are welcome to come. Upcoming dates, um, on Saturday the 29th of April, 7 p.m., Country Gospel Concert. More information to follow soon. If I've missed anything, just read the bulletin and Shannon's gonna come up and do a mission spot. Good morning, everybody. <sighs> I am unprepared as usual. <laughs> um, Maribor Baptist Church highly values mission, and when I say that, I don't like we can tend to kind of compartmentalise that into overseas mission, um, but we mean all kinds of mission. So whether it's to your neighbour, to a colleague at work, um, wherever you go and wherever you are, uh, we value mission. Um, we also at this church value supporting those people who go to the least rich people in the world, and so we support all of these people, um, some within Australia and some overseas. Um, many years ago, the mission committee started this um, idea of having a little um, yellow, yellow envelope to collect money. So like basically, I think the idea was if you had, uh, instead of buying a cup of coffee, you might put that money in your mission envelope and pop it into the church so that we can send that overseas for you. Um, we also have an online account these days, so you don't have to do the envelope if you want to go online and do it online. And um, come to the mission meeting if you want to know more, I think. I think I made it one. Is that okay, Judy? That's fine? Yeah. I think we, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. <laughs> um, so I'll just have a little prayer for those that we follow in mission. Father, we just thank you for the richness of the blessings we have here in Australia, Lord. And we are so grateful to be able to share a little bit of that with people that go overseas, Lord, to share your message, to spread your love and to be your hands and feet in places that we cannot. And so we just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. In prayer, Father, you are a gracious God and you love us and you've provided the way back to you through your son and we give you thanks for that and your blessings continue to flow day by day so Lord this morning we give back a little bit of what you have given to us whether we do that online or whether we do that um, through the the tins at the front door or out the, in the hall just recognizing your love for us and that you have called us to be generous to those around us as well. So Lord, accept our tithes and offerings this morning. We give them with a grateful heart. We ask that you bless them. 
Lord, as a church family, we have a number of people who are on our mind who are not well at this time. I can mention a few by name, Lord, but I'm sure I'm not aware of everybody's needs. So, Lord, for all the prayers and concerns that we have on our heart, we lift them to you. We pray for your intervention, for your healing and for your grace, for everybody who's on our, on our minds and our, on our hearts this morning, Lord. Particularly, Lord, we lift up June to you with her cardiac investigations this week. We pray for the treating team, that they will have wisdom and understanding of what's going on for her and be able to manage that well. Lord, for June's grandson, who's um, got some medical invest investigations going on as well, we lift him up to you. As a 17-year-old, Lord, it's a time of, of anxious waiting for him. So, Lord, we lift him up to you. Lord, for Helen Brain, who's so special to us in her back pain at the moment, Lord, we lift her up to you. We pray for a complete recovery for her and restoration of her health. And for Tim, as he continues to support her um, in her disability, Lord, at this time. Be with them both, Lord. Lord, for Robin going through some dental pain at the moment and probably looking for antibiotics, Lord, we lift her up to you. Be with her. Ease that pain, Lord. Lord, for Nancy and Ian Gordon, um, as Ian's just recovering from back surgery, Lord, we lift them up to you. Be their um, portion today, Lord, and ensure that Ian's recovery from his surgery goes well. Lord, we lift up Diane to you this morning. She's got a number of things on her mind with the passing of her neighbour um, this, in this past couple of weeks, but also her husband Ian, Lord, going under health investigations as well. Lord, we lift up Diane and Ian to you this morning. Give the treating team wisdom and understanding of what's going on for Ian so they can manage that condition well. Lord, for Robin Roylands and, um, and um, Peter, Lord, we lift them up to you. Peter's health's not that flash at the moment, so Lord, uh, be with him at this time. We know he's a, a, a son of yours, so... Lord, we lift him up to you. Strengthen his faith at this time, Lord. And Lord, we also take some time to think of Reese this morning with his sore ankle and the debilitation that is um, leading to him. Lord, we lift him up to you. We pray for a uh, recovery from this, um, from this knee, from this ankle concerns, Lord. Lord, this morning I want to take some time to anoint him. And we say thank you for your love for him. We say, um, we ask for recovery for this ankle, Lord, for relief from this pain, that it's no longer a, a barrier to his ministry, Lord, that he be f returned to full functioning so that he can fulfil the calling that you have for him on his life with us here in this community. Amen. It's good to see you. I want to say thank you on behalf of the diaconate for um, your prayers for us over this weekend. Um, we had a great time of retreat, a time of restoration of relationship with God and with each other and development of those relationships. So thank you. I was um, preparing for this Sunday during the week. I had the thought come into my mind that um, that verse that says that God is the Father of the family in heaven and on earth and and so um and i just thought we don't often think about the family in heaven do we like we we think about it when we know we've got someone there and that's great but we don't actually think very much about the family in heaven but they're one family it's a family in heaven and on earth they're they're our family and um and so i, I went and found the where that verse was and it's in um, Ephesians. And Paul's, he's, he's asking that our love would overflow. And he says, Overwhelmed by what grace communicates, I bow my knees in awe before the Father. Every family in heaven and on earth originates in him. It's his idea. His is mankind's family name, and he remains the authentic identity of every nation. 
I desire for you to realise what the Father has always envisaged for you so that you may know the magnitude of his intent and be dynamically reinforced in your inner being by the Spirit of God. This will ignite your faith to fully grasp the reality of the indwelling Christ. You are rooted and grounded in love. Love is your invisible inner source, just like the root system of a tree and the foundation of a building. Love is your reservoir of superhuman strength, which causes you to see everyone equally sanctified in the context of the limitless extent of love's breadth and length and the extremities of its dimensions in depth and height. I think that means that no one's left out. What do you think? Romans 12, 13 says, Purpose to, with resolve to treat strangers as saints, pursue and embrace them with fondness as friends on equal terms of fellowship. And verse 16 says, Esteem everyone with the same respect. No one is more important than the other. Associate yourself rather with the lowly than the lofty and do not distance yourself from others in your own mind. You know, the depth of God's love for us reveals, is revealed in how we have been saved. He's rescued us from the deepest pits and he's continuing to rescue us. So let's praise him. As we, as we just become aware of his presence within us, as we become aware of who he is and who we are, let's praise him. Praise our Father.
Father, your loving kindness has never failed us, your faithfulness. We're so grateful that we live in the place where mercy and justice kiss in our hearts, in our lives. We need you, Lord, every hour 
We need you every moment. We need you more today than we did yesterday. And we will need you more tomorrow. But thank you, Father, that you meet us in the here and now in these moments to reveal your goodness, your grace, and your love in the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, team. Very grateful for your ministry among us this morning. Well, good day. How are we doing? I, I want to add my thanks to Tony uh, for your prayer for us uh, Friday night. We, the Elders Deacons Leadership Group, we, we gathered and we had a fantastic nosh up at the back, which was just, uh, did nothing for the waistline, but boy, oh boy, it was good. But the, even what was richer than the food was the fellowship and just the, that hanging out together, spending some time. And, and yesterday, Sharon, thank you again for opening up the healing rooms and that space is such a blessing to us and gives us permission. Um, we had an amazing time as a, as a group of of people together, uh, sharing, both hearing from God, from each other, sharing warmly and richly, and it was just a, a, a wonderful time. So thank you for your prayer for us. A while ago, um, Gwen gave me this book to read, um, The um, Heaven is for Real. It's actually this, as we, and by the way, this is the third of our messages in our Sense series. Um, but I'd like to open it up like this, because uh, this is a story of a four-year-old boy, Colton Burpo. He almost died when his appendix searched, uh, burst. He, he, he recounted an out-of-body experience when he was in surgery. And in, in the stories that his parents put together afterwards, uh, he reported that he'd been to heaven, that uh, he met Jesus, that he met his grandfather, who he'd never met, but recognised him from pictures on the mantelpiece. He met a sister who had died before he was born and didn't even know, he's four years old, didn't even know he had a sister, but met his sister in heaven. Quite fascinating. Um, and after a while, as the conversation leaked out, the parents put all the pieces together and, and they've absolutely convinced that he, their son had been transported to heaven. It's actually a fascinating story. Fascinating story. And you might think that, that news of heaven's reality would be re welcomed, yet it's not actually the case here. I read one account that claimed Colton's father, Todd, he was a Wesleyan pastor, uh, and he was almost removed from ministry. The congregation's numbers plummeted. We're talking about Imperial in Nebraska, in the Midwest, very conservative, Republican, very much on that kind of right-wing swing. And um, the congregation... It was outside of the direct revelation of Scripture, so therefore, um, then Colton and his older sister Cassie began to get bullied at school. There were prominent families in their community that began to uh, ridicule Ty and his wife. And these events prompted Pastor Burpo to to ask his congregation, why does the possibility that heaven is real upset you? You know, I, I read book reviews um, on, on this book. And there were Christian groups that dismissed Colton's story as fanciful nonsense. They rejected it as conspiracy that Todd was wanting to capitalize on the book sales around the topic of heaven because it's a topic on everybody's lips. Everyone wants to know about the reality of what's, what's beyond the grave. Well, I want to know about the reality about what's above the grave in the here and now because I think that's what Jesus was about, actually. But they, they thought this, this pastor was trying to profiteer. Why would people not welcome the reality of heaven? 
Uh, I think it's actually easier to keep heaven as a sort of an ad- abstract concept in a fantasy world, you know, a dream world, and we keep it out over there rather than deal with the reality of it. But I actually think heaven is now. If we understand Jesus saying, you know, people will say of the kingdom of God, look here, look there, look here, look there, don't believe them. The kingdom of God is where? Within us. That's, isn't that here and now? Huh? What of, of this do we miss out on? Because if heaven is real, it must affect the way that people live their lives has massive ramifications and it was so for the first disciples the empty tomb shocked them troubled them they they spent the story we're looking at this morning in john 20 the 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 early parts of that passage in 18 and 19 that mary had been to the tomb and and they'd sent um the runners back understanding that the Lord is alive and they, Peter and John ran to the tomb, wasn't there. And the one thing that they knew, that the the events of that Sunday changed everything and they were never to be the same again. They were were scared. Let's have a look at it. In fact, they were so scared that Jesus turns up and says, Listen, boys, have courage. No, I didn't say that at all, did he? He appeared in the room with them and he said, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Can you imagine if you were to hear that? Um, wouldn't your next question be, so does that mean we get the same end as you? Wouldn't that be the, ne- wouldn't that be the, the dialogue going on? As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. What? To get the same end? Wouldn't that be the top of the head? Anyway, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. But Jesus came to his his 11, because of course Judas, Judas wasn't there. And at that point, there were only 10 because Thomas had stepped out of the room. And they were hiding behind locked doors. Now, sure, you know, they've heard Mary's report, but they were frozen by fear behind locked doors. I don't know if they had windows, but I reckon they'd have been locked as well if they hadn't. They feared the Jewish authorities. I'm sure they were wondering if they were next to share the fate of Jesus. I mean, put yourselves in their position. They'd they'd followed Jesus for three and a half years. They'd seen him go through all of the trauma leading up to the crucifixion. They'd seen him crucified, dead, carried to Joseph of Arimathea's tomb and buried and they scattered they betrayed him at his time as need didn't they and peter by the time the cock crows three times you will deny i'll never deny you lord three times oops oops i mean i think it isn't it's quite embarrassing isn't it to admit that fear determines our lives more than opportunity you know the the whole deficit thinking plagues us we look at things we look at a circumstance a situation the first question we ask is oh what's wrong here not what's right the disciples were chained to their fears of the authorities and rather than the, and explore and step into the freedom, wonder and promise of new life that Jesus brings, that he had immersed them in for the previous three and a half years, they locked themselves behind a door in a room, in an upper stairs room. Upstairs room. And look, I don't mean to be unkind to the disciples. Surely they needed some time to process their new reality. I mean... Quite frankly, this is seriously mind-blowing stuff, isn't it? 
There were things that, from their own world that they had to let go of. Their time-held truths and traditions no longer served them. They were no longer fit for purpose. They were no longer adequate to contain the resurrection of Jesus. They had no reference point apart from Jesus. What a great place to be. No reference point bar him. They had nothing to hang anything on. They needed to work out what to keep. Because it wasn't all bad, but they also needed to work out what to discard. And that really didn't dawn on them until Pentecost, 40 days after Jesus' ascension, when the Holy Spirit manifested, visited and manifested. That they, that as a group of people, they were so chained up. And in some respects, we can be as well. Not to Jewish authorities, not to fear of the Romans. But it's our fears that hold us trapped until we let them go. Our fear of strangers keep us locked up from meeting new and interesting people. Our fear of crowds can keep us locked up in our homes. We limit and maintain ourselves to the confines of the smallness of the world that we find manageable because of our fear of the unknown. Now, I was talking with someone recently who said they kept to a very small number of family and a very tight group of friends. And in the course of that conversation, they said to me that uh, they had had past issues with anger. And as we began to kind of tease that out, they, we had a really meaningful conversation about how anger worked. Actually, anger itself is a mask for our other losses. Anger is not the thing itself. It's actually what you're responding to that, that generates that reaction to. It might be a loss of hope, a loss of opportunity, a loss of a relationship, a loss of your wallet, a loss of your keys. And if you're searching your car, looking for your mobile phone for 10 minutes, realizing 10 minutes later you, you, you're losing, you're, you're using it as your flashlight. <laughs> uh-huh. You ever done that? Hang on, I'm just looking for my glasses. Just a tick. Oh, yeah, here we go. I'm wearing them. But do you, do you know what I mean? This fear of loss. And I suggested that the reason to keep a small group of friends is because the fear of being hurt causing the emotions to run amok. Their captivity wasn't to anger. Their captivity was to fear. I mean, maybe the saying, we've got nothing to fear but fear itself, is true. A couple of weeks ago, Tony preached a cracker on 1 John 4, 18 and 19. And in the, the end of that passage is perfect love casts out all fear. What a wonderful truth. Because where do we find perfect love? Come on. Where do we find perfect love? Hello? Jesus. We find perfect love in Jesus. But you know, the natural thing to do when we feel anxious or threatened is to withdraw. Lock the doors and the windows. And we become fearful and we focus on our insecurities rather than, and it's tough, it's difficult at times to remain open to the risky mission of Jesus. It can be really challenging to us, but that's what we're called to. Now, the exciting promise of this story is that Jesus can't be stopped by our locked doors or windows. That's good news, isn't it? Isn't that good news? Jesus came to his first disciples amid their fear, their pain, their doubt, their anxiety, their confusion, their being locked behind doors and windows and he appears and says, peace. Shalom. 
You may think it takes courage to overcome fear and you would be wrong. Jesus gives them shalom, peace, that holistic sense of personhood, of well-being. The peace that comes from Jesus is not the absence of conflict. Not at all. It comes in the midst of conflict. That's where we discover the peace of Jesus. And when we experience fear, pain, anxiety, doubt, confusion, he comes to us similarly, speaking peace, breathing life into anxious lives with the Holy Spirit. And this brings us freedom. We are freed by peace. Jesus appears among his first disciples. The locked doors are no barrier to him. No barrier whatsoever. The peace Jesus extends to us is by the Holy Spirit's presence. We are not alone. Jesus has promised to be with us always until, oh yeah, just until it suits him. I think that's not what he says, is it? I will be with you until the end of the age. This is our reality. We know what this piece is like. I'm singing to the choir here. Some of us have faced daunting health issues, medical challenges, loss, while experiencing a peace that passes all understanding because we know God with us. Emmanuel. Others have experienced overwhelming financial and vocational upheaval. And we've been able to work through, the, work through and walk through those times because God's presence and the peace that he extends to us is real. As a church community, we're not immobilized by the situations that we've faced. The ebb and flow of ministry, 140 years of history, of growth and decline and ebb and flow. People who choose to come and go for whatever reason. And we try to learn what we can do, how we can develop, how we can grow good ways and healthy ways and enabling ways for people to be involved and, and come together as a community. But you know, no one can please all the people all the time. But we're not overcome by fear of change. I, I know when I came here three years ago and I spent that week here and I looked at who Maryborough Baptist Church is and, it's, and the DNA, the divine nurturing attributes of this group. And I'm so encouraged that this group is a pioneering group. The history of this church, we have planted churches out of this church. I can't wait till we get to that point again. We are a church that will have a go at stuff. We've had a go at the Granville meeting place and that's still going on. And we've released that to bless that in Jesus' name. We've got a wonderful ASD support group and we had a meeting with Shannon and, and, and Denise through the week with, with a, a mum and, and we're talking about creating a safe place for kids with neurodiverse challenges. What a joy. A church would actually give something like that a crack. My goodness, who are we? You know, we've just appointed a coordinator for coach. How good is that? Community mentoring, making a difference for people, helping people do life well. We've just launched second Fraser Coast Boys Brigade. What a cracker. As a core expression, all of these things are core expressions of who we are. We don't have to do more. 
just simply need to realise the peace of Jesus in our confusion, anxiety and uncertainty. He breathes to us, he says to us, receive the Holy Spirit, now go and forgive. Now go. You see, we know about this stuff. We're not overcome by uncertainty or fear or change. Uncertainty of what the future will look like because God's presence is with us. And that's not God bless us for no more, amen. That's God, give us more of your presence that we can show you the presence of your love with those around us. I was blown away yesterday at our, our leaders retreat with an overcome with, with just incredible excitement for what I see God doing among us. The possibilities that are before us are amazing. It's a wonderful, wonderful journey that we're walking together, that we work together. But you see, and, and this is the bit that really broke through to me yesterday, is that in Jeremiah, just one of the reflections we did, Jer Jeremiah 29 and verses 10 to 14. And this is to a people who are in exile. And Tim's going to preach on this in a couple of weeks when his cow gets well, and she will, because we are praying and trusting God in all of this. But in, in three verses, 11 times God self-references, he says, I, 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 I. Now, God doesn't self-reference very often like that. More often than not, he's quite understated. And then he says, me, me, me. You will seek me. You will find me when you seek me with all your heart and I will be found by you. These are direct statements of God. God has got this. God has got this. You see, our peace isn't dependent on our intelligence or the depth of our faith, the determination of our personality. It's not by might nor by power, but what? By my spirit. And what does Jesus say? He breathes, receive the Holy Spirit. What amazing truth. Our peace is based on the Holy Spirit. Our peace is based on the love of God. Our peace is based on the grace of God. Our peace is based in the presence of God through the person of the Holy Spirit. So in this sense of being sent, it's not out of, oh, jolly good. We're, good. we're all good to go now. Thank you very much because we've got it all together. No, 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 no. It's because we haven't got together, but we know his peace. In the face of trauma, in the face of difficulty, in the face of challenge, in the face of relational breakdown. It's, it's knowing his peace, his presence, his purpose. You know, it never ceases to amaze me how the gospel is understood by some to be made a self-serving, self-centered and selfish pursuit throughout the generations. That people can read the stories of Jesus and the disciples and believe that the peace of Jesus is for them and them alone. God bless us for no more, amen. That the Holy Spirit is given somehow to allow some people to have a spiritual experience and no closeness to God, but not others. I just don't get it. That they are blessed to know and enjoy abundant and affluent life, but too bad if you belong to this group of people over here or if you don't do something or other over there. But as I understand the gospel, as Sharon said earlier, it's about forgiveness and restoration and making that available for all. And that's the story of the early church. 
That's how I understood it. So nothing could be further than the truth of the gospel being a base of power for an individual. It's just not the way of Jesus. When the disciples received the Holy Spirit, they were delivered from their fear. And Jesus sends, sends out of trauma, out of the midst of confusion. And then he's like, how good is this? How good is this news? This is our Jesus. This is what he does. He doesn't say, get it all together first and you'll be fine. He actually says, you know something? I'm okay with you not having it all together right now, but guess what? Receive the Holy Spirit, peace, and away you go. There you go. Isn't that what, doesn't that make sense? Isn't that our Jesus? Isn't that what he says? And he sends them to bring his redemption, his restoration of all things good by extending forgiveness to a broken world in his name. That which you forgive will be forgiven. And this sending pattern is, is a resounding pattern in John's gospel. God the Father sent Jesus, his son, to proclaim God's message of redeeming love, redemption, restoration for humankind. Jesus now sends the disciples to continue that ministry. And um, Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians 5.19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. We don't go and condemn, we go and forgive. Jesus sending his disciples to continue his work establishes this unbroken link from God to Jesus. Jesus to John, John to the Christian community, the Christian community to the world. Not because they're ready, not because they're prepared. Well, they are prepared by the Holy Spirit, but that's it. And in this story, John validates the witness, the testimony of the Christian journey. The Holy Spirit establishes the ongoing presence of peace, the peace of Jesus within the lives of the disciples, so that, as we heard a couple of weeks ago, in this world, we are like Jesus. Tony said it so well. Being like Jesus, it's not an exhortation. It's not aspirational. It's not something we have to whip up. It's actually a recognition of what is the presence of the Spirit of God with us. And being sent like Jesus is sent is fundamental to who we are. If we truly belong to him, being sent is not just for those strange ones who go over there. As I was going to say, Shannon, when you're saying, hey, you know, I'm thinking, mate, preach it. You just go for it, girl. That was real good. You don't have to go overseas. It's in the neighborhood. It's, it's in the workplace. It's, it's as we get engaged people down in the marketplace. It's, it's wherever we happen to be, we're sent. And it's um, important that we understand. I mean, we may not be sent far. We may only be sent to our families or our neighborhood or our place of employment. Where we are sent is secondary to the point we're sent. That's the important thing for us to understand and know that we are sent, that we partner with Jesus in his mission. As the Father sent me, so too I'm sending you. Wherever we are to share God's love, grace, to bear witness to what God has done in our lives, to extend forgiveness to others in Jesus' name, that they too can find their way home. Yep. You've heard me say recently, we may, we may be God's precious, most precious possession, and we are. No two ways about it, but we are not his ultimate priority. His ultimate priority are those yet to find their way home. Those who are yet to discover forgiveness in Jesus. And according to John in this passage, Jesus' commission to us is being sent that we're enabled by his purpose, his peace, and his presence 
to do just that. Continue in partnership with him in his mission of redemption and restoration. And so we join Jesus in his peace, enabled by his presence and purpose. And I want to, I really want, I want you to hear me say this clearly this morning. It's okay to be fearful. It's okay to be anxious. It's okay to be uncertain. It's okay to doubt. But we are invited to not get locked up in those places, that Jesus comes into those places. Not let those things be the centre of our attention, the defining of who we are and how we respond in our lives. But to recenter and refocus as Jesus comes to us behind our locked door and says, peace, peace, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus breaks down the doors that we hide behind. He gives us the Holy Spirit and peace. And he sends us out to carry on his ministry just as he was sent out by God. Before I close, I found this meme online the other day. It just yelled at me really, really loudly. I had to share it. This is from Bishop Leslie Newbigin. He's an amazing missiologist of, of the passed away a couple of years ago. He says, the deepest motive for mission is simply the desire to be with Jesus where he is. Isn't that true? Don't you want to be where Jesus is? That's on the frontier between the reign of God and the usurped dominion of the devil. I just thought, man, that's so good. If we need any more motivation, there it is. Deepest motive for mission. And I, I think Mother Teresa kind of said it like this, I wish there was no heaven to, shun, uh, heaven to gain or hell to shun that I could simply love God for who he is. You know, that, that thing of we just want to be where Jesus is. And where are we going to find him? Yeah, we'll find him among the gathering of believers, but you know something, we're really going to find him in the context of mission and ministry to those who are yet to discover him. So let's reflect just a little bit this morning as we bring this morning to a close. Is there anything holding you back? Fear, anxiety, frustration, uncertainty, doubt, relationships? I mean, where is it that you need to find the peace of Jesus this morning? Are you going to be game enough to bring that concern to Jesus this morning and exchange that for the sense of his peace, his spirit, and his sentness. Maybe maybe we need to pray together. I mean, Celia is here, one of our elders, Tony as well. We've got our deacons as well, friends in the church. We can pray together. It doesn't have to be prayer with me. It can be prayer with the person next to you. But if there are things that, places where you have been hiding behind locked doors and you need to discover Jesus' peace and his presence and his purpose, I'd love to pray with you. We'd love to pray together this morning. So let's just do that right now. Holy Father, we're grateful for your loving mercy and your kindness. We're so grateful for these stories that show us the rawness of, of the real story, not the sanitized version that we like to preach that the disciples had it all together and it was out of a sense of having it all together that they were sent. It was actually the opposite story, that in their brokenness, in their fear, in their anxiety, in their doubts, in their uncertainties, in their trappedness to their system, yet you step in doors were no barrier to you. May they be no barrier to you for us. May you step into our lives similarly. May we hear you speak to us, speak to our doubt, our uncertainty, our fear. May we, may we hear you speak to our, un, our, our frustration, peace, shalom. 
May we know and hear you speak to us, receive the Holy Spirit, that we receive the loveliness of your Spirit this morning. And that we may receive that sense of sentness, of of carrying your message of hope and redemption into the world, forgiving people in Jesus' name that many can find their way home. Father, we bless you for your grace to us. We bless you for each other and that we are indeed in this together and we commend one another to you to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus and the only one who can ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you
want to sit and pray for a bit, I'd be delighted to do that. For our online family, if there's any need out there, you could send us in an email request. We will pray with you, encourage you in your sentness. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you all for being with us this morning. We've actually got a bit of extra morning care out there, a bit left over from Friday night from the leaders. So you can jump in, jump in quick for a nice caramel tart. Or there's a beautiful, there's a bit, sorry online viewers, but there's a beautiful red jelly cheesecake based slice. And if someone, if someone would dare to keep one of those for me, get a ride on the Harley, okay? <laughs> All right. But if, if, if anyone, yeah, if, any, if anyone would like the blessing of prayer, then let's do that. Join us for morning tea, but go, let's send ourselves out with this resounding, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. Let's sing this. Here we go. Yeah, I will build. I will